Uh, so, uh, welcome, Dr. Sorin Pislaru. Sorry, uh, Dr. Sorin is chair of the Division of Structural Heart Disease in Mayo Clinic. And today we are going to discuss about some new strategy in tricuspid valve disease. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sorin. It's a pleasure to uh, share the, the presentation with you. So, we are expecting to listen to you. Martin, thank you so much for the invitation. Again, a great pleasure to be part of, uh, of the symposium put by the Cardiovascular Institute in Buenos Aires. You guys have a fantastic group and it's always a pleasure to, to work with you. Um, um, it's a tall order to, to talk about the tricuspid valve disease. As everybody uh, knows, there's a tremendous interest in this uh, condition. And, and I think it's time to, to look uh, at some of the problems we face in this particular field. So if we talk new things, we must have a really new understanding of, uh, of tricuspid regurgitation. We have new assessment uh, tools, and of course we have new therapies. So we'll take them one by one. How about the new understanding of the disease? So is tricuspid regurgitation relevant? And the answer to that is, uh, well, it occurs in, a pro we estimate about 1.6 million uh, patients with the moderate or more uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation in the United States. So that's not insignificant prevalence. And the problem with that is corrective surgery, it's still very, very unusual. So less than half a percent of the patients who have severe tricuspid valve regurgitation will eventually undergo surgical intervention. Uh, and the reason for that is mortality has been traditionally high for isolated tricuspid valve surgery, about eight to 10% and unchanged as, as I'll show in a little bit. Um, um, if we separate the tricuspid valve regurgitation, much like with the uh, mitral regurgitation, we talk of primary disease and secondary disease. And of course, primary disease, the disease of the valve, whether that be degenerative, rheumatic, valvulitis, carcinoid, congenital, and so on and so forth, many, many conditions that can affect the valve. Whereas secondary disease, we say the valve is normal, but there's something wrong with the chambers something wrong with the annulus uh, from various um, uh, uh, reasons. And then the valve doesn't quite well just because the chambers on the annulus are dilated. And in many ways, it's a simple system to classify the tricuspid re the regurgitation. But at the same time, this is a critically overly simplified way to look at tricuspid valve regurgitation. And why is that? This is a very highly variable disease from a standpoint of the mechanism. And I think everybody agrees that the tricuspid regurgitation associated with Epstein, it's very different from the tricuspid regurgitation associated with pulmonary hypertension that is severe. It's very different from uh, patients who have carcinoid and so on and so forth. So very, very, very different entities. It is a highly uh, variable severity. What does it mean? It varies with the load. You diarise the patient, there's no longer regurgitation. It varies day to day. It varies beat to beat. It varies with respiration. So, so there's high variability in the degree of regurgitation. And it has highly variable outcomes as we shall see in just a little while. Now, what we do know for many years now, for over 20 years uh, since Nat published his seminal paper in 2004, was that tricuspid regurgitation is bad for you. And this is from his uh, seminal paper, about 4,000 patients with uh, tricuspid regurgitation that have been following in time. And if you have pulmonary hypertension, or if you don't have pulmonary hypertension, there's a gradation in mortality according to tricuspid valve regurgitation severity. And the same goes for normal EF and low EF and so on and so forth. So various classification in this paper. So it's clearly there's a signal there that tricuspid regurgitation is increasing mortality in patients. But what people kept saying for the longest time is that you do not die of tricuspid regurgitation, you die with tricuspid regurgitation. In other words, it is the comorbid conditions that lead to tricuspid regurgitation that get you rather than the regurgitation itself. Or is it? So let's look back a little bit. So there's some data already from the same year, 2004, when David Messica Zaytun was a young fellow at Mayo Clinic working with Maurice. 
uh, there's clear data that flail leaflets have excess mortality. So if you have a patient like this gentleman who had a flail leaflet after a biopsy, you cannot leave that in place because that's not going to go well. So there's clearly more observed mortality than expected for the uh, patient uh, age and gender. And if you have carcinoid, almost 30 years ago, Patty Pelica showed uh, that carcinoid patients who have right heart involvement, meaning TR or PR, clearly have excess morbidity than those who do not have cardiac involvement. So there's clearly a, an impact of organic heart disease on mortality. And because of that, most of the times people agree, if you have organic heart disease with severe tricuspid regurgitation, that's not going anywhere. If patient is at acceptable risk for surgery, you should probably correct it if you have symptoms of signs of right and peristaltic dysfunction. How about patients who have uh, secondary uh, mitral regurgitation, meaning that the valve is intact. And uh, Jan Topilski, when he was with us uh, back in 2014, uh, worked with Maurice looking at patients who have this idiopathic TR, meaning patients who do not have systemic disease. They do not have coronary disease. They do not have diabetes. They do not have pulmonary hypertension. They do not have anything that you may think about in terms of uh, cause of uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation. It's just an incidental finding. And what he has shown is that if you have severe tricuspid regurgitation in the ERO more than 0.4 centimeters squared, you clearly have excess uh, morbidity than uh, if you uh, do not. So, so that's important to, to remember. Even isolated TR can uh, be associated with excess mortality. The important uh, thing to remember from this study is also that only about 16%, so one in six patients had surgery at five years in this cohort. So again, underreported, under-referred. Um, uh, under this is a study from Chad Zach and Erin Fender uh, a few years ago, where they took the national inpatient sample, which is a database uh, from about 1,000 hospitals. And you can see the number of isolated TR surgeries in, in uh, United States is still low. It's hundreds per year, so very, very low numbers, slowly going up in time, but still very low. Importantly, mortality is flat at around 8 to 10% over the last, uh, over the decade that it was observed and really has not changed any over the last decade since 2013. So, so it's still high mortality. And what does it mean? It means that the morbidity associated with tricuspid regurgitation is still severely under-recognized by the medical community and patients are under-referred for intervention in this particular uh, uh, disease. So we thought, how, how do you even address that? Because really, it is not the cardiologist who first see the patient. It is the internist, the general practitioner, who's going to get an echocardiogram because patient starts having peripheral edema or dyspnea, and they get the report of severe tricuspid regurgitation. So we, we felt that an important step is to make a very simple clinical score. Uh, so how do you make that? Well, you take 13,000 patients who have uh, had their first echo at Mayo Clinic and who had at least moderate tricuspid regurgitation. And then you look at which are just simple clinical variables. Don't get fancy. Don't get any sort of E prime, S prime, TAPSI, and all those mumbo jumbo that echocardiographers use because nobody will understand in primary care. Just simple things. So we selected eight variables <clears throat> that had the highest impact on mortality, and we developed this uh, tricuspid impact on outcome score. And then we validated that in patients who had uh, uh, disease uh, at uh, Florida and the Jacksonville uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, and we found the same thing. So these are the factors. So it's simple. It's age. Gender, if you're a man, it's, uh, it's worse for you. If you have renal dysfunction, if you have heart failure, if you have lung disease, if you have elevated liver function tests, if you have a resting heart rate more than 90, and of course, if you have severe tricuspid regurgitation. And you assigned two points or one point depending on the, the hazard ratio with uh, each variable. And then you just sum these and you get the trio score. So in theory, your maximum score is going to be uh, uh, 12. 
So this is what happens with overall the patients. There's a good gradation between moderate, moderate, severe, and severe TR, much like in the Carnat paper. So, so we saw exactly the same um, in a different cohort from a different institution. Now, if you apply the TRIO score, so if you look at the score, you see that the mortality is much more graduated. So, so you see going from a score of zero to a score of 10, mortality changes tremendously in these patients. So you can group your patients in low score, intermediate score, and high score. And these are going to be very, very different patient populations. And it's important for the internist to know that you may have different impact on patient outcome. So low score, intermediate score, high score. So what is the impact of these uh, in relationship with tricuspid regurgitation? If you take these ones, the low score, the low trio score for mortality, what you see here is that the degree of tricuspid regurgitation is very, very separated. So if you have severe TR, much more mortality than if you have moderate TR. If you're in the intermediate risk score, the difference begins to, to kind of shrink. There's still a difference, but much less pronounced. And if you go to the really high risk score, it really doesn't matter if you have moderate TR or moderate severe TR or severe TR. And therefore, what this would imply, of course, it's not proven, but what it would imply is that maybe you need to focus on the group of patients who have low or at most intermediate risk uh, in terms of intervening on the tricuspid valve, because probably here you are not going to make an impact. These are very, very sick folks. Whether you correct the TR here or not probably doesn't make a difference to them, at least in terms of mortality. Yeah. We have new assessment tools for these patients. So I think that really in this day and age, uh, uh, an, echocardiograph uh, an echocardiography assessing tricuspid valve regurgitation without 3D, it's uh, incomplete. So you cannot assess tricuspid valve without uh, three dimensions. And the reason for that is provides extraordinarily important anatomic information. And of course, we now know very well that many valves do not have three leaflets. You can see the bicuspid valve on the left. You can see a nice quadricuspid right, uh, valve on the right. You can uh, get anywhere from two to uh, eight, nine scallops of the tricuspid valve. Not only that, but it also allows you to look for relationship with structures. This patient had two separate echocardiograms, which said that the pacemaker lead is associated with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Remember, it's not because you have a device lead to the valve and regurgitation of the valve that you are going to have severe TR because of the device. And in this particular patient, if you look in the 3D data set, you can see that the device lead sits very nicely in the posteroceptal commissure. Just look here, posteroceptal commissure. And the regurgitation really occurs between the septal and the anterior leaflet, between the septal and anterior leaflet here at the distance from the lead. So this is important information because it's going to change your therapy. This is a fantastic review by Luigi Badano and Denisa Muraro. Um, uh, they are now uh, uh, in Milan. And, uh, and uh, they go over the new uh, uh, 3D related technology in quantitating uh, uh, disease severity in terms of vena contract at 3D PISA, assessing the uh, right ventricular size and volume, the right ventricular ejection fraction, proposing new cutoff values for all these parameters. So it's a very, very good paper. I would encourage everybody to look at that. And then of course we have new therapies. And if you just do Dr. Google and look at what is there. So this is what you come up with. Uh, lots and lots and lots of things that uh, are being tried right now. Of course, surgery, it's a classic intervention. We did participate mostly um, in uh, the early study with Pascal. And of course we did some off-label um, intervention with the mitra clip system. But I'm going to show you a case that was uh, done with the Pascal system. This is um, also uh, edge to edge repair device. So it has a gripper, but it also has um, a spacer in the center that allows for the leaflet to, to coapt on a surface that's smooth. Um, and this is the patient. Again, 3D is very important for this patient. So what you see here is that there's a large coaptation gap between the septal leaflet 
and the linearized anterior and posterior leaf flat. Many times patients who have torrential TR look like this. The valve looks like bicuspid because it's stretched and it looks like a one large septal and one, one large anterior posterior leaf flat. And of course, if you do the 2D, you see massive tricuspid regurgitation here in the commissural view because regurgitation occurs along the entire coaptation line. Now, when you go to transesophageal echo, this is a very important view, the transgastric short axis, because that gives you the short axis anatomy of the valve. It also tells you where you should put your biggest effort. And if you see here, regurgitation occurs in the center of the valve between the septal and anterior, but also septal and posterior leaflet. The problem that you have here, lots of cords, so it's going to be hard to get in there. So we, we thought maybe somewhere here would be a good landing zone, and then we should try to grasp the septal to anterior leaflet. And this is how it's done. Um, Again, uh, it's um, it's much harder procedure than the trans that the edge to edge repair of the mitral valve, just because there's a lot of shadowing. Many times we use intracardiac echocardiography for this, but essentially you uh, you place the device and you make sure that you have a good tissue bridge, and then when you are certain that you grasp the two leaflets, you release. And of course, you still have a lot of tricuspid regurgitation. So you start with torrential tricuspid regurgitation, you probably improve to a certain degree. And if you look here side by side, the before and after, yeah, we still have severe TR, but it is less than what we had before. And if you quantitate, you probably went from the torrential TR probably to uh, severe TR, so uh, to, uh, to gradation. And this is the uh, report from the early feasibility study, just 27 patients, but in general, New York Heart Association improved that one month, and we had at least one grade reduction of uh, regurgitation severity in 85% of the patients. So then if you talk new strategies, what we cover today is that Tricuspid regurgitation is really a very variable disease, a very variable populations that uh, have this. We propose a new risk score system that allows a simple clinician, just pure clinical factors to decide whether their patient is going to be low risk or high risk. And then we talked a little bit about the importance of three-dimensional imaging in uh, assessment of tricuspid valve disease and some, uh, some therapeutic options. But bottom line is we need to refer patients earlier to intervention, whether that be surgery or percutaneous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sorin, for your excellent lecture, as always. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first is related to one of the biggest concerns about TR uh, is the surgical or interventional timing. So in your daily practice, uh, have you seen your score, the score you propose, uh, improve uh, in some way the, the, this matter? Well, so, so the score has yet to be published. It's still under review. So, so we, ah. we don't have prospective data, but, but you would imagine that it should help. Uh, I mean, if you, if you say, whenever I talk with the surgeon, the surgeon says that tricuspid valve repair or even replacement, it's um, from a surgical perspective, technically not challenging. You know, it's not a hard, difficult, sophisticated surgery. It can be done fairly, uh, fairly quickly. Um, um, and, uh, and then why should the mortality be so high? Why do we stay at 9 or 10%? And it's easy. By the time somebody decided that you need to do something to the valve, is by the time everything else failed. So, so patients are humongous, those of diuretic, and they still have resistant peripheral edema. So, so we need to slowly move the bar lower. Of course, we also need to prove that by correcting the tricuspid regurgitation, you actually improve mortality, which was not shown so far. So we need, we need to show that too. So it's going to be a long drawn process to select the patient. But where we are right now, certainly we refer the patient way too late for an intervention, way too late. So, so we need to move the bar earlier. Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, for another, uh, if you have, you, you have told it in your lecture about the classification classify the TR is not so simple or so easy that say it's primary or secondary, uh, but do you recognize any type of um, 
TR that is not suitable to percutaneous treatment? Well, so, so yeah, sure. Um, I, I would say the percutaneous solutions that we have today are still generation one. So, so, so these are, uh, it's a cumbersome procedure. Everybody who has been involved with the transcatheter repair, whether that be by aneuloplasty, whether that be by clipping, um, oh gosh, this is not easy. This is really not easy for the interventionists and for the imager. So it takes a long time. Uh, so it's first, it's the generation one. The second, of course, severe pulmonary hypertension were excluded from all trials so far. And, and in general, they are contraindication for surgery too, because what you fear is that the right ventricle will fail and you know surgery is so successful and the patient dies because they, they cannot separate from, uh, from bypass. So, so yeah, there are patients who are not going to be eligible for, for uh, tricuspid intervention, whether that be percutaneous or surgical. Um, yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much for your time and for your answer and your lecture. Everything was excellent. Thank you for the invitation and hope to see you guys soon. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. All righty.